one, of course, that sets us up to think about what is going to happen or what we remember, or I should say, in, in uh, this coming weekend. Why does Luke record that Christ needed a messenger from heaven to strengthen him to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane before the crucifixion? Didn't he have the strength to pray as he should when he was in the Garden? You know, was he, was he weak? Or was he already near death? And was there a concerted effort to kill him by Satan, even in the Garden? Why did Christ choose a garden for this battle? It's a battle, not my will, but thine be done for his, a battle of the wills. Why a garden? Why a place of prayer? His special place of prayer. Do these thoughts affect your understanding of the greatness of God? Does it affect your view of salvation? We're going to have a look at a little bit of that and um, because we're coming up to Easter. Turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 22. I've already promised I'm only going to preach a short time tonight. So I might even at the end ask if anybody has a question or a comment because there's some very deep water here and I think we'll just skim across the top but I think we'll see some wonderful depths. Luke 22, I better find Luke myself. 39, Luke 22:39, 39. And he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place... He said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat were, was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come and we look at this, we pray for your Holy Spirit's moving in our midst. Lord, give us an understanding. Give us fresh thoughts. Give us uh, a fresh appreciation of our Saviour. And may we have, get an understanding of the momentous, the enormous time of Christ in the garden with a view to Calvary. Lord, I thank you for these people here this evening. Lord, there may be many comes with particular needs upon their heart. It might be work-related, relationship-related, marriage-related, finances, whatever it be, Lord, we would lift it up to you. You know our hearts. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for those that have travelled a distance to be with us this weekend. I ask your blessings upon them, both in their travel mercies and, and Lord, just in, in their life. We pray for uh, the home church with Pastor Shaw there in Ballarat. We ask your um, blessings there. Lord, we thank you we can gather around your word now when we come so, Lord, with a certain amount of reverence. And Lord, I certainly don't understand all that is here. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would illumine as we go. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Gethsemane has been said it's the place to view Calvary from. When we come to look at Easter and approach Easter, do it from the perspective of Calvary. And we're going to be, of course, having an Easter service this coming weekend. Verse 39 tells us it was Christ has his habit as he was wont. It was what he was accustomed to in verse 39, to go to the Mount of Olives and pray in the area of a garden. And Gethsemane means oil press. It was a garden of olive trees on the side of the Mount of Olives. Judas knew that this was Christ's habit, his, his, his custom. And so he would bring the Roman soldiers and those temple guards, can you believe it, to Christ's special place, his place apart where he would pray to the Father, where he would be alone in prayer. It was a, a special place to him. And that would be ruined, it would be devastated by this um, intrusion of all of these noises and people. Why did he pick this garden 
as this place of a battleground of the wills. Why would he pick a garden? Human history began in the Garden of Eden and so did our first sin. For the redeemed, the whole story will climax in a garden city. We see in Revelation, there is a garden city to come for believers where there'll be no sin. But between the garden where man failed, where Adam fell, and between the the city of God, there's a garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will accept, his will will be tested and he will accept the cup that the Father has offered him. John tells us that Jesus going down to this garden crossed the Kidron Brook and that's got a lot of um, connotations because Christ will cross that brook. When he returns, praise God, when he returns for his second coming he'll land on the Mount of Olives, he'll go down and he'll stop at the brook Kidron and he'll scoop some water and drink and then go up through the uh, the gates, the um, golden gates of from memory. But anyway, I was getting off the track there. John might have been thinking about King David. Remember King David was having to leave Jerusalem. He was fleeing from his son Absalom. Both David and Jesus were throneless kings. They were accompanied by their closest friends and rejected by their own people. Kidron means murky or dark and Gethsemane means an olive press it's a place where the olives are pressed and squeezed until they're almost destroyed to let the juice out to let all the olive oil out and the olive oil will flow and both names are significant and it's in this olive press a place where the olive is is squeezed out this particular garden where Christ will accept the cup from his father's hand In verse 40 we read that Christ warned his disciples of entering temptation. Was it just physical tiredness or was there spiritual dullness? He was warning them of. Verse 41 tells us he got alone, a stone's throw, stone's cast. He kneeled down and prayed. And verse 42 is going to tell us the subject of his prayer. It tells us what was he praying about. Look at verse 42. This is what he was saying. <clears throat> Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Father, if you will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. He's saying, I want to follow your will, but this is what I'm feeling. But I want to follow your will. Our Lord Jesus, of course, has lived a perfect life of obedience. And this is the the pinnacle as he comes to to Gethsemane and then Golgotha. Philippians 2, 7, the kenosis passage tells us a lot about it. It tells us that Christ made himself of no reputation. And some Bible versions would say that he emptied himself or he's given up all that he had. He's put aside his divinity. Um, There are variations of meaning, but there's one central fact we need to remember. Christ was always fully God and fully man. It's a mystery. He was fully God and he was fully man. And it's been said that Jesus, who is just... I've started said that wrong. Said that Jesus, who is just less than God, is like a bridge broken at the farther end. You can't get anywhere across a bridge that's broken at the other end. If Jesus wasn't fully God, you would never get to where you want to go. And such a Jesus could not deliver from Satan and sin. And the Bible doesn't present such a Jesus. He was fully God and fully a man, a fully the obedient man. Philippians 2, 7 reads, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. So there's a mystery here that God the Son is serving the Father. He's doing this for the Father as a servant. And it's all summarised in not my will but thine be done. Earlier in his ministry Christ would say in one sense the Father is greater than I. It's John 14, 28. 
But he's also said, and it doesn't contradict it, he said, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. So we see that Christ was submissive all the way through to his Father. He was a servant to his Father. And, and that's enormous. Peter would tell us, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So what are we saying is Christ was always submissive to the Father's will. The Garden of Gethsemane was that place of testing. Like the Garden of Eden was the time of testing for Adam. And Adam failed. But our Lord Jesus Christ would be triumphant. We know that Christ had the power of God upon him at this time, but he didn't use it. When he was arrested, Christ said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Oh, folks, I reckon one angel would have been enough. One legion of angels. <laughs> I mean, it was just unbelievable. We, we even see when they came to arrest Jesus, they say, are you Jesus? I can't remember what he said exactly. And Jesus says, I am. And they all fell over backwards. It was like, and the, the Roman soldiers couldn't help it, of course, because they're all in line and they all fall over like dominoes. It's, it's like that was the word of God, he, word of Christ. He could have defended himself. There was no shortage of power. But that wasn't the purpose of the Father. God had a purpose here. And Christ was going to follow that through. Just consider then for a moment how dreadful the sound is of Christ's voice at the, at the great white throne judgment for those that are lost. The one that has come to die for them. The one that was perfectly obedient to the Father and has given man an opportunity to respond and now they hear the voice of him that would die for them in judgment. How dreadful that they have spurned him that has done so much for them. So Christ has come apart a, a stone's throw. Matthew tells us he's become very sorrowful and very heavy. Christ was praying to the Father to have the cup of the death on the cross removed from him if it was possible and if the Father was willing for it. The other Gospels record the term he said, my Father. There's that sense of closeness, that sense of relationship. It was a language of relationship. But where was the relationship now? In a very real sense, he's alone. He's in a great sorrow of spirit. Christ knew that he was going to die for the salvation of the people. Before going to Gethsemane, he warned his disciples that they were going to forsake him. He quoted Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So Christ was willingly submitting to this striking. So what's happening here in Gethsemane? It's like Christ is saying, here I am. I've come to confirm all that's agreed upon. I'm, I will do your will if there be no other way. And the enormity of it all is upon him. He's about to be separated from the Heavenly Father. He's about to take on the sins of the world and he's bearing some of that great burden even here. The first Adam fell in a garden and the last Adam would battle and be triumphant. And it appears the later the night got, the greater and fiercer the conflict became. It appears as we look at this that Christ was pleading with his father and it appeared that it was gone on for some time and it's like the father was silent and uh, his, his prayer was, was just going up and there was an oppressive silence because it was like the Christ kept pleading and bringing it before the Lord. And it's not like the father didn't know or the father didn't care or was indifferent. No, this was part of something that Christ had to go through. This was part of his suffering. This was part of all that was for him to endure. This was part of what divine justice required. The Heavenly Father had deprived his son of the sense of his presence. Finlayson wrote, The finger 
of the father was upon the pulse of the lonely sufferer, sufferer in Gethsemane. And when the heartbeats of the one in conflict seemed to weaken, heaven concerned itself about him and an angel was commissioned to his physical aid. So fear an angel. The heavenly father has reached out his hand to Christ. Even in the darkness and Christ knew it. And initially I'm sure the, the presence of the angel must have brought some sense of comfort to the sufferer. It came at a moment when unaided human nature could no longer take the strain. He was getting near the end of his, his human limits. He was at the end of, end of it as such. It was a critical moment. Christ knew that this sorrow was unto death. He knew how close he was to death. Matthew 26, 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and, and watch with me. He's saying, The sorrow in my heart is so great that it's almost crushing me. This sorrow, this prayer, is, it's, it's, it's going to crush me to death. It's going to take my life. This is a serious thing that is, that is happening here. And it could have happened. He said it could have happened. So why was he strengthened? To pray more earnestly. He was strengthened to suffer more. Look in verse 44. And being in an agony... He prayed more earnestly and his, dread, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It was not the Father's will that he should die in the garden. Just as in the wilderness when Christ endured, the angels came and ministered to him. Now an angel ministered to him again to give him strength to go to greater depths of suffering, to go greater, more... more to pray more earnestly in prayer. How strange is this? A creature sent to minister to the Creator, but then he's here as a man, made a little lower than the angels. Do you know there are, there are so many questions that we could raise here and we don't have the answers and praise God that the Bible doesn't try to explain it away and, and give us answers because it would be too shallow for us to truly grasp. There's a mystery. There's a time to walk by faith and not by sight. Bishop Ryle says this of Christ in the garden, it is a depth which we have no line to fathom. It is a depth we've got no line to fathom, no way of understanding. How, how in our own human experience can we gather the depth of what's going on here when Christ is praying? For one fleeting moment, immense joy must have leaped within Christ's soul as his father via the angel touched him. We could say even the father's hand through the angel touched him. This was a message from home. This was a message from heaven. He was forsaken, but he's not disowned. His father was there somewhere in the darkness. His loud cries and his tears had not been unnoticed. But whatever the comfort was that that angel brought, it soon passed. Because the scriptures say he would now pray more earnestly. The burden was on him even now stronger, more stronger. He, he was really being weighed down. It was anguish beyond human endurance. Let's read again verse 40, 44. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was strengthened to endure more, to have the battle intensified. The battle of the will the battle to be obedient to the Father, the battle to give, which would go against everything within you, the form of self-preservation to, I will be obedient to the Father. The battle had to go on. We would say it's too soon to say it is finished because it wasn't finished. It hasn't been paid for. The Lamb of God must have the strength of a lion to finish this battle. 
Some writers say verses 43 and 44 shouldn't be there. You might see it in some of your Bibles to say it's not in some uh, manuscripts. But those verses, um, in fact, not referring to those verses, but there's a book out called The Medical Language of St. Luke. And it goes into verse 44 and it talks about the words, the agony, the sweat and drape and drops of blood, they're all medical terms. They're completely consistent with Dr. Luke writing them. It would be, you would find it extremely hard to believe someone else has written them. Dr. William Hobart that has done that study, the writer tells us the term translated drops of blood was currently used in medical circles for a clot of coagulated blood. And that's where we get our English word thrombosis from. Luke somehow has gained this insight when he's researching. He's found this insight into it and he's giving us an insight of what was happening there in Gethsemane and and the agony of Christ. Luke's reinforcing the idea that Christ was carrying a crushing load. And whatever's happening there is beyond our comprehension. Remember, a little later on we'll see a group of soldiers and people around a fire trying to stay warm and you've got a man praying great swat great (laughs) drops of blood that sweat like great drops of blood and some say it even become drops of blood as his capillaries were bursting and the strain and the stress of it all it was a cold night something in something was happening for us there folks remember the garden of eden and the fall Now the Garden of Gethsemane and the victory for us. For us. He went through it all. I don't understand the depths of his agony, of his will, just to be obedient and submissive to the Heavenly Father. But this... In this garden, there was a victory that has undone what's happened in the Garden of Eden and the fall. It's been said the real truth is that while he came to preach the gospel, his chief object in coming was that there might be a gospel to preach. He came to drink the cup that the Father has given him to the full. I'm not sure if it's a poem or if it's a hymn. Death and the curse were in our cup. O Christ was full for thee. But thou hast drained the last dark drop. Tis empty now for me. That bitter cup. Love drank it up. Now blessings draft for me. As we approach this time, may we stop and understand this is not just a long weekend, it's not just a holiday period and maybe made longer by Anzac Day, this is a time to remember what Christ has done and our salvation is no small thing. This was no small happening, his will, a batter of the will and then of course he would hang on that cross to die for us. This is no small thing. And it was for us. It was in preparation for us. The real truth is that while he came to preach the gospel, his chief object in coming was that there might be a gospel to preach. Let me pray. Dear gracious, gracious Heavenly Father, truly we don't understand the depths and yet it's good to consider it's good to think about it it's good to cast light on it from one angle and then another and another and we'll discover a magnificent jewel a a diamond of reds and blues and whites and greens for truly you are there is in Christ unsearchable riches we thank you for that Lord I thank you for these people for their attention I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity of gathering here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Perhaps before we have our...